Bienvenue to Swakant to Reporters Plus, our programme that goes beyond the headlines. In this edition, our reporters come face to face with the Taliban in Afghanistan. Now, this is a rare insight into the people behind the name that strikes fear into local people and allied soldiers alike. The decision of the Americans to withdraw their troops on a timetable ending on September the 11th has given the extremists a cue to step up their campaign of killing. Our reporters hear firsthand how the Taliban intend to target more and more places to ultimately take control of Afghanistan. This report from Afghanistan is by Margot Ben and Solen Shalvon Fioriti. Herat, Western Afghanistan. We pass the last base of the Afghan army, an entrenched camp which Afghan soldiers rarely leave. Beyond it lies a desert disputed by several armed groups. After months of negotiating, high-ranking Taliban commanders have agreed to meet us somewhere on this desolate track. With us, a translator and an armed escort. There are a lot of IEDs now on this road, but now it's because under their control, there's no fear of the IEDs. Is it true? Now, apart from this, no one else can come in and out. As we head deeper into the desert, the sound of automatic weapons resonates all around. Conservative, or better you have work The Taliban have asked that we meet in this no man's land, just outside an area they control. For the occasion, they've planted the movement's white banner. Yeah, that one, I speak with. Commander is waiting for us there. The interview will need to be short. These aren't good conditions for an interview. Usually, we stay in the mountains. We came down specifically for you, but normally we don't sit like this in the open. These fighters moved into the region just a few days ago. The extremist insurgency is gaining ground throughout the country and multiplying attacks, especially outside large cities. We're expecting even more reinforcements. Yesterday, two other units came to this province. We are surrounding Herat province and are awaiting orders. If we are told to capture this city, then we will capture the city. When we take a village, we sleep in the mosque. We don't bother people in their homes. But the first thing we do is close down the government-run schools. We destroy them and sack all the teachers and staff. Instead, we put in place our own religious schools, which follow our own curriculum, in order to train future Taliban. After the interview, the Taliban allowed us to film a village under their control. Their goal, to convince us that the movement is not just a military force, but a credible alternative to the official government. For us, it will be a rare window into this parallel state which could, if the Taliban come back to power, foretell the future of Afghanistan. Go ahead, continue reporting. But if we spot any government vehicles coming into the village, whether you're there or not, we will attack. Enough talking. There are often drones flying around here. We can't stay any longer. Uh, 
throughout Afghanistan, the fight rages between government forces and the Taliban, whose brutal regime was toppled in 2001 by an international military coalition. The fundamentalist guerrilla force is collecting victories. As foreign troops withdraw from the country, the drained Afghan army seems unable to contain their advances. Today, the Taliban control or contest more than half of the country. They rule over vast swathes of land, mostly in the countryside. Areas that haven't benefited from the more than $150 billion injected by the international community for development projects. Many funds were diverted by the elite and redirected towards the cities. Emblems of modernity for some, symbols of debauchery for others. They are the last bastion of the Afghan state against the insurgents. Havens of freedom where citizens can enjoy pleasures forbidden under Taliban rule, like trendy barber shops, long walks among girlfriends, dancing at weddings, or launching a kite into the sky. the rebels are at the gates of even the country's largest cities. And if the negotiations with the government conclude in a power-sharing agreement, the Taliban could reach their objective, the reinstatement of an ultra-conservative Islamist regime. Less than two hours from the capital, Kabul, we enter the valley of Omar Khail. Again, fighters have been sent to escort us. Officially, they're tasked with ensuring our safety, but in reality, they're here to keep an eye on us during the entire shoot. In the village, we meet Najibullah Siddiqui, a respected figure in the region. He's one of the rare people who agreed to welcome us in their home. Two decades of troubled foreign presence have fueled people's mistrust of Westerners. In the garden, his 10-year-old daughter, Zainab, is busy at the well. The house has no running water. The family has always lived in this village, which the Taliban overran 12 years ago. In the mornings, I pump water and I do some chores around the house and then I go to school. I want her to study her lessons as soon as she wakes up. Leave this, I'll handle it. You go and study hard at school, okay, Zainab? If you're good, I'll buy you toys and books and crayons. Here, there's no government-run school, only a school for boys, which teaches the Taliban curriculum. As for girls, a couple of neighbors have taken it upon themselves to host a classroom in this house, in front of which armed men are patrolling. As they hope to negotiate a power-sharing deal with the Afghan government, the Taliban leadership is promising to let girls study until the end of elementary school, a way of reassuring the international community. In this improvised single classroom school, girls of all ages are taught religion. In front of the camera, the teacher can't show her face. She translates the Quran from Arabic into Pashto, the language spoken in Wardak. In the Quran, there are many words to describe God, to say how powerful he is. And you can pray at home, in the street, anywhere. Islam is the main subject here. In how many years was the Quran brought to the earth? In 23 years. And who is it revealed to? To Prophet Muhammad. And who brought the Quran to the Prophet? Gabriel, peace be upon him. 
We need a real religious school. Help us build one. I've memorized the entire Quran and have many students. They're smart and they are dedicated. My religion class lasts for four hours per day. As for the Taliban, they don't cause us any problems. The girls come to get an education and I am at their service. Religion class is over, girls. The math teacher is on his way. Hello. Welcome, everyone. How are you? Have you done your homework? A man who teaches math to a classroom full of girls, a surprising scene in Taliban country. I'm going to write some math problems on the board, and one by one you'll try to solve them. OK, here's one. 8 times 3 equals... We can find out by using this method. And then you multiply. Here, 12 by 5 equals... We're going to use both methods we've learned. Now we multiply 5 by 2. Do you get it? People say many bad things about the Taliban, but they're wrong. They let both boys and girls go to school because it will benefit the next generations. Until now, our generations have been deprived of an education because of the war. If girls learn maths and science, they can become engineers, economists or teachers. In fact, there's little chance that Zainab and her classmates will ever make it to college. Nearly 80% of Afghan women are illiterate. And in Taliban areas, the rare women with university diplomas often come from larger, government-controlled cities and are employed in the health sector. Like here at the clinic, behind this curtain, the waiting space for female patients. The Taliban have ever so slightly relaxed their policies on women's health. Are you ill? Come and have a seat. Sorha Sedekat regularly comes here from Kabul and receives patients from all around the valley. Twenty years ago, the Taliban would have forbidden her to practice or even study medicine. Today, she heals the wounds and souls of the fighters' wives. I've lost my appetite. I haven't eaten in two days. Do you have problems at home? Yes, I do have some problems at home. What kind of problems? Are you having trouble conceiving a child? I had a baby, but he died. Oh, I understand. You will not say it's your fault that you killed the baby because you didn't take good care of it. All Afghan women have psychological problems. Not just here. Women don't really go outside much. They don't even hang out amongst each other anymore. In this district in particular, it is true that women have a very difficult life. They're always covered. They don't have any distractions. Does this hurt? Yes. What about this? Yes, it hurts up to here. Sorha Sidikat is one of the rare women who commutes between Kabul and Omar Khail. On the way, neither the Afghan army nor the Taliban stop her. A tacit understanding between the two enemies allows a safe passage of medical personnel. Yes. 
On the day I arrived, the Taliban asked to see my medical degree. They read it carefully and double-checked with the university in Kabul that I had indeed graduated from there. Only then did they hire me. In Kabul, I don't wear a fully face veil, but here I need to wear it outside my practice, it's how things are. If I didn't wear it, people might think that I come here to put bad ideas in women's mind and encourage immodesty. When the Taliban were in power in the 90s, women couldn't see male doctors. In short, they were barred from any access to health care. The patient has contractions. How much is she dilated? Today, they allow Dr. Azim to assist the midwives. In this clinic, no one is part of the movement. Here, open your hand. It's better if I put the needle in this arm. How old are you? I don't know, but I was married very young. And how far along are you in the pregnancy? This is my ninth month. Very well. The patient is about to give birth, and the women have asked me to leave the room. But if there's an emergency, I'll come straight away to assist the midwife. Tell the other women in your village to come give birth here, at the hospital. But women prefer staying home. I know, but that's not a good idea. When you see your relatives, please give them the address of this clinic and tell them about all the good things that the staff here are doing. The baby's healthy, it's a girl. The patient is dressed, you can come in. How are you feeling? I'm okay. Check her blood pressure. Outside the sanctuary, women are invisible. The market, right next to the clinic, is the village's economic hub. A man's world, where Taliban fighters are everywhere, scrutinizing passers-by and shopkeepers who happen to all sing their praise. Zainab and her father are here to do some shopping. Hello, I'd like to buy a children's notebook and a crayon. I have pens here. Zainab, what would you like to get? A book. And some pens? The Taliban have ruled that expired food was forbidden. If they find expired food in my shop, they give me a fine. I think it's better to live in Taliban territory. In government-controlled areas, you can't travel after nightfall or stay open late. It's too dangerous. Here, my shop is open till 8 p.m., and I'm not the least bit worried. As for women, they can come into my shop even if they're not accompanied by a man, they just have to wear a burqa and the Taliban won't stop them. In the two days we spent in Omarkheil, we never saw a single woman in the market. <laughs> Before, we couldn't drive our stock out of the city, the road was too dangerous. We had to make detours, now everything is calm. When the Taliban arrived, they encouraged us to go to the mosque. They sent letters signed by a religious scholar, which said that we were to tell them if our neighbours or friends didn't go and pray at the mosque. 
and then they'd go and pay them a visit. From food legislation to the frequency of prayers, the Taliban are involved in all aspects of daily lives. They even invite themselves for tea in the Siddiqui's living room. <laughs> Najibullah never belonged to the movement, but a tragedy brought him closer to the Taliban. Eight years ago, Afghan and American forces attacked his house. I didn't used to drink tea with the Taliban. I didn't care about supporting any side in the war. We civilians just want to study, educate our children, earn a living. And then the American and government soldiers came and showed their barbarity. They spread terror and sadness here under the pretense of fighting the Taliban. You mean there were airstrikes? Yes, airstrikes, and also they came into our house. They kicked the front door open and destroyed all our furniture. They were so cruel. They killed our children in their sleep. I lost five members of my family. All were children or students. At least the Taliban were born here. We know all of them. They live in our homes, our villages, our communities. And from them, we've never suffered any injustice. According to an independent watchdog, Afghan forces supported by the U.S. Army are responsible for up to one-third of civilian victims of the conflict. This fuels a feeling of resentment and lends support to the Taliban's rhetoric that they are the defenders of the Afghan people against brutal foreign invaders and a dysfunctional state. Afghanistan is a mainly rural country. The development projects funded by the international community rarely reach the countryside. Year after year, Mohammed Wardaki's orchard suffers from drought. That's what the good these fields are fertile, but there's not enough water, so they dry up. No reservoir or dam was ever built here. I've yet to see any modernization projects in our area because of the war. Over here, I have apricot trees. They'll bear fruit soon. The apple trees haven't blossomed yet. This year, we were able to export our fruits to Pakistan, but usually we sell them in Kabul. The Taliban don't cause any problems. On the contrary, they even help out with my business. Here in the Taliban Emirate, you can travel by night or day. You can carry money without any worries. The danger lies mostly on the road to Pakistan. You know, the Taliban belong to this countryside. They know how to cultivate the land. Each year, the Taliban collect 10% of the crops, a practice called oshar. It's an Islamic tax imposed on farmers, which the insurgents use to fund their activities. It's a religious duty. I give between 27,000 and 30,000 Afghanis per year for osher. It depends on the crops. If business is good, I pay more. If it's bad, I pay less. 30,000 Afghanis, that's 300 euros, a large sum in a country where half of the population lives under the poverty line. The size of the tax, like other laws, is determined here in the mosque. Today, this assembly of religious dignitaries and fighters have gathered to ban practices which they consider profane, like music during weddings. As women, we were not allowed to enter the mosque, but our translator was able to shoot some images of the meeting. The ruling is adopted. All those who do not respect our decisions will be prosecuted. In Afghanistan, this is what is known as the shadow government. You and you, over here, follow me. Maulawi Sabir is the Taliban district governor, one of the officials of this parallel state. Uh, 
The Sharia, the Islamic law, applies to all, from the layman to the most powerful leader. That's how we administer justice. As far as the Taliban Emirate reaches, the lives and belongings of people are safe. We are at war. But in the village, you'll see that we've implemented many projects. We have schools, agricultural programs, cool storage for the fruits and vegetables. And when we won't have any reason to fight anymore, the war will end and we will develop this country in every domain. After examining the bills, the Judicial Assembly gathers outside. In the areas they control, the Taliban have established local courts known for their rapid resolution of cases. The Afghan justice system is one of the most corrupt institutions in the country, so many Afghans, even some who live in government-held areas, seek the services of the Taliban tribunals. Where are the files? Someone bring them to me. Today, three men have been summoned by the judges. The first two are fighters accused of using their weapons in a civilian context. So why did you fire in the air? I didn't know it was forbidden. Raise your voice. So you fired. But why? Were you celebrating? Yes, I was celebrating a wedding. Are you aware that you violated the rules of the emirate? I didn't know about the rules. I'm new in this area and wasn't informed. Well, we had distributed official letters to all the village elders. The commission has decided to disarm you because you disrupted public order. Firing in the air is forbidden. It scares our fellow residents. Do you agree that you have violated the rules of the Taliban emirate? Yes, I confess. <laughs> You, why did you fire your weapon? Because my friend had just returned from the front line. So you were celebrating? Yes. Didn't you know that firing for no reason is forbidden? I did, yes. I apologize for my actions and I will never do it again. Okay, but we have ruled that you will be disarmed until further notice. Sir, please come forward. The third man is accused of spending too much money on his son's engagement party, a punishable offense according to Taliban law. What's your name? My name is Haji Pashamir. Do you know why you've been called to appear in front of the commission? My son is a Taliban fighter and I was celebrating his engagement. Your son is a Taliban, not you. Yes, but I was celebrating my son's engagement and he's a Taliban. Being a Taliban doesn't give him any additional rights. On the contrary, people like him or even myself should be punished even more severely than other people because the Taliban's mission is to do jihad for the love of Allah. So if instead they cause problems for other people or if they fail to prevent wrongdoing, then they should be punished very very severely. Mm. Mm. Yes, I agree with uh, the witnesses. I don't deny that it ever happened. But originally, we'd only invited six people. Then the in-laws suggested that my son invite more people, more women. And my son agreed. I wasn't even there during the discussion. And now everything's on my shoulders. I know that we must abide by the law of the emirate. I love the emirate. And my son is a fighter of the emirate. So what? Those two over there are fighters. And we've just disarmed them. If it's proven that I've broken the law, I'm ready to be hanged rather than receive a lighter sentence. You say that you're ready to accept any type of punishment? Yes, I'm ready. But under one condition that I'm not found guilty without proof. Understood. We will continue our investigation. Here, people are very poor, but they spend huge sums on their engagement parties and weddings. To fund these events, they often need to pawn their land, their garden. They go into debt. 
So the religious erudites and combatants of the emirate discussed this issue and concluded that people should spend less money. Because in Islam, according to Sharia, extravagance is a sin, and acts that go against Islam must be avoided. The Taliban take pride in their supposedly egalitarian society, but women remain the first victims of their cruelty. Shortly before we arrived in the countryside of Herat, where we filmed part of this report, a young woman was publicly flogged by a Taliban judge. Her crime? Indecency. She had, allegedly, spoken on the phone with a boy. If this woman had been married, she would likely have been stoned to death. In Omar Khail, the district governor would have convicted her in the same way. Today, just like yesterday, all Taliban decisions must be in harmony with Islamic law, whether it be stoning to death, decapitation, or mutilation of the hand. These are strong principles of Islam. They're strong principles of Sharia, and we will never change them until Judgment Day. We leave the village's oppressive atmosphere with a strange feeling. We've met a new generation of Taliban who are running a system that more or less functions, but where barbarity remains. Those who refuse to bow to their will have no choice but to flee to the cities. For many women, it's a matter of survival. The Khalili family took refuge in a quiet part of Herat city. Masuda, the mother, used to run a school for girls in Khorian, a rural district which the Taliban took over two months ago. This book is about the love we have for our mums, and I really like that topic. Tell us about the day your mother decided to move here, in the city. It was night time, and mum came to me and said that something happened at the school. There'd been a suicide attack. Some men had tried to blow up the school. Mummy said that we couldn't live there anymore. And she said, now that they are attacking schools, we need to go and live in the city. But I miss my mountains, my animals and my friends. Masuda keeps in touch with her former neighbors. Other women from Khorian, who, like her, fled when the Taliban arrived. I bought you some sweets. That's so nice of you. I put them on the plate. Sahaila Abzadeh is a young widow who used to sell homemade pastries at the village to feed her family. Security is so bad in Horian. You know that there was heavy fighting last night? They fired a rocket on Kosar school. Yes, these days it's better to be sad here than to live over there. I miss my sons who stayed in Horian. I was a teacher for 19 years, and for the past two years I'd been promoted to school principal. I taught all the village girls. Some of my pupils even became doctors. I had to leave because I received threats, because I was working for a government-run school. The eve of our departure, there was a lot of fighting. My husband said we could no longer stay there. 
there. He said, if they don't kill us today, they'll kill us tomorrow. What about your cakes? Do you manage to sell what you bake here? No, here at the market, no one buys them. At the market in Horian, I was employed by a bakery. I loved my job, and business was good. In my village, we were a group of 10 or 12 women who were working, but we kept receiving threats. They would throw letters full of threats at the places where we deliver our cakes. They'd keep repeating to the village leader that they were going to shut down the little kitchen where we worked, that they would hit it with the rockets. So all the women got scared and stopped working. The money we'd earn from morning till evening made us proud. After that, we had to stay home and wait for the men of the village to decide about our lives first. All this because we sold sweets at the market. I have pictures on my birthday. Oh, show me your phone. That life is behind us, our houses are behind us, and us, well, we're here. Those were the good days. That's the garden. Oh, yes, the garden. Look, look. Yes, the children were so free. There's that swing they would play with. I look at this and it just makes me miss everything even more. The people, my neighbors, my school, the little streets. No one is more unlucky than Afghans, don't you think? No one in the world would trade places with us, not even for an hour. Since 40 years in the cities and the countryside, Afghans mourn their dead. More than a million victims slain by an endless war. With the withdrawal of foreign armies and the Taliban's incessant advances, Afghanistan's future seems bleak. But a tenuous hope lives on, of peace at last among Afghan brothers. <laughs> That's it for this edition of Reporters Plus. You can, of course, see it again on our website, france24.com. Thank you for watching. Stay with us here in France 24, but most of all, stay safe.